check, 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 check. Testing one, two, one, two.
Are you, is that okay, Jessica? Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, welcome to day, to, to day two of our conference on inflation, monetary policy, and the public. Uh, for the, some of you I know who are just arriving today, um, were not with us yesterday, uh, we had a, um, a, a very nice session yesterday. And, um, and uh, yesterday's conference was a little bit more focused on uh, research, and today we're going to bring it down to a more practical level. Um, one more comment. I'm going to, uh, this is um, going to be my last set of public comments as president of the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, for those of you who weren't with us yesterday, I mentioned that I'm going to be um, retiring, and so I've got 48 hours left as president of the bank. <laughs> and so I think it's fitting that in my last public statements as president that I'm going to be talking about inflation. The Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland has had a very long dedication to the cause of studying inflation. And um, as you know, the Federal Reserve has a mandate for price stability. And it's, you can't achieve that mandate without having a solid understanding of where inflation has been, where it is, and where it's going. So getting a better read on inflation is something we at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland have been wrestling with for many decades. For example, uh, back in 1972, and, and one of my predecessors, uh, Willis Wynn, now, he, um, now I was not here in 1972, but, <laughs> but, um, but it, Will, Willis Wynn um, did make a comment on inflation measurement. And you'll remember that was an interesting history, time in our history in, in terms of, of inflation. And his, obviously we weren't doing it as Federal Reserve, we weren't doing a very good job in fighting inflation. So Willis Wynn, the president of the Cleveland Fed, made a comment, which may be why we weren't doing a very good job, is when you look at the inflation measurements, it's like looking at a thermometer that is broken. So more than 40 years ago, uh, the president of the Cleveland Fed, um, Willis Wynn, noted, uh, and he made that statement uh, because he knew we needed to make more progress in how we measure inflation. Yet, even as we refine the measurements of inflation, and we still are struggling with some of that, and obviously we're talking about that at this conference, one thing we have not struggled with, we've always maintained the conviction that price stability is a fundamental driver of economic growth. Lee Hoskins, another one of my predecessors, uh, who was at the pre uh, made a uh, statement in 1988 when he noted that an environment characterized by inflation and uncertainty regarding the future of inflation is likely to retard growth and profits. And that assessment has stood the test of time. Finally, to give you an idea of just how important price stability has been to the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland presidents, I'll share a story about my immediate uh, predecessor, Jerry Jordan. Jerry was fascinated by the concept of dollar stores because in dollar stores, the prices never changed. And I still have a postcard that he sent me a month after he retired. He had gone to Mexico and he found uh, the dollar version of, um, uh, the me uh, peso version of the dollar store. It was, it's called Uno Precio. And he said, where everything in that store sold for 10 pesos. And his note, comment, his um, final note on that postcard was, price stability reigns. <laughs> so the importance of price stability was ingrained in me uh, by the time I became the 10th president of the bank here in 2003. In fact, I have given many speeches on the importance of price stability in my years, my 11 and a half years as president. In June of 2004, I gave a speech in which I emphasized that price stability enhances economic welfare. I said in that speech that price stability 
enhances economic welfare by creating an environment in which people can make better decisions. Indeed, I regard maintaining price stability as essential for optimum economic performance. That is why price stability is the primary objective of monetary policy. And in this speech, I say, under the leadership of my predecessors, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland established a strong commitment to the primacy of price stability. These, le these leaders saw the, the pursuit of price stability as the key to achieving sustainable economic growth. In a speech that I gave a year after that, in April of 2005, that speech was titled, Power of Price Stability, and I quoted Dante. I said that even as early as the 14th century, the dangers of inflation were discussed. In the Inferno, Dante writes about the fate of counterfeiters and other falsifiers of money, the people who were responsible for devaluing the currency. He places them in one of the deepest parts of hell. And again, <laughs> and again, in the third, his third book, The Divine Comedy, Dante predicts a terrible fate for two other officials, one French and one Serbian, who debased their currencies. According to a translator of his writings, Dante envisioned this severe punishment, not because he loved money, but because he believed that a sound coinage or sound money was an essential principle of social order. We are not, fortunately, so quick to condemn those who practice inflation today uh, in the same way, but we do understand uh, so clearly that inflation doesn't introduce all sorts of costly distortion and uncertainty. I also became a very strong advocate of a numerical objective for price stability, and the FOMC did ad formally adopt 2% in, uh, objective for inflation over the longer term, and I was very pleased to be able to, to be a voter that supported that action. So you can see that the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, we really do take price stability seriously. And uh, today at lunch, you are going to hear from the 11th president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and I think it's fitting that she is making her first statements, not as a president, but an incoming president, on inflation, because I'm, that will continue our, our focus uh, here at the bank on this important issue. Now, over the years, one of the reasons that I've given many speeches on inflation is because our research department, as I mentioned yesterday, who've just supported me uh, so uh, well in these years, um, they have done a lot of work in the area of um, of uh, inflation, and over the years, the research department has uh, made some significant strides in helping us better understand inflation dynamics. Uh, first, we developed alternative measures of inflation, known as the median CPI and the trimmed uh, mean CPI. Uh, in fact, two of our, uh, our researchers that were very critical in that role um, are here today. Now, they've left the Cleveland Fed and their Atlanta Fed, and we have a great partnership with them, um, Mike, Brian, and, and Brent, but, we will, um, but, but, we, but they were here at the Cleveland Fed when we started that, and we continue to obviously publish those measures. Research at this bank has also um, found that those measures, the median CPI and trim mean CPI, can give policymakers a much better read on underlying inflation than other measures. In addition, our researchers have developed improved me methods for forecasting inflation, and uh, we've made significant contributions in our understanding of inflation expectations. And you're going to be hearing about uh, these measures and these models later today, um, and I know many of you already have because we those are um, areas on our website that get a lot of attention and a lot of hits. So for the most part, the past few decades, uh, we at the Federal Reserve uh, have, um, have really thought through and have developed models that are useful in spotting the developments of high and variable inflation. And I should point out that during that period of time, the past few decades, the Federal Reserve has successfully fulfilled its objectives to keep high and variable inflation in check. And until the recent recession, keeping high and variable inflation in check was 
uh, what I stayed focused on. But following the financial crisis, my attention has turned to a less familiar concern, and that is persistently low inflation. We, I mentioned even in my comments earlier on about the fact that you know, we knew that fast rising inflation was costly to economic performance. The problems that are associated with inflation that's persistently low can be equally harmful. And this, and so in, in some ways, you know, I've had the unique experience, but not, not wholly welcome experience, of seeing inflation as a two-sided threat. You know, we've spent so much time focusing on inflation that's, that's above the 2% objective, but uh, it is a two-sided uh, threat, and it needs to, we also need to focus on, infl on, on and prevent inflation from falling below our 2% objective. And we recently uh, published an annual report, and, and uh, it, it, it was our 2013 annual report. And in that report, we continue the tradition of inflation research by examining why inflation is currently low and why it matters uh, that inflation is currently low. Overall, I, I will say that I'm very proud of the Federal Reserve's track record on, on inflation during the time that I've served as, at the FOMC. Um, and you know, many of my, some of my predecessors have, have expressed concerns to me on occasion that uh, some of our monetary policy actions, this very highly accommodative monetary policy action, um, could be inflationary. And I remind them that I have a better track record on inflation than any of them have had. <laughs> But I'm trying not to brag about it, because we do have to get back on track to this 2% objective. So um, I, uh, we're going to dig into day two of our, con our conference. Today's agenda uh, is sent. I mentioned that yesterday, day one, was more research-focused. Uh, Today's agenda uh, is centered on the theme of talking with the public about inflation. And so today, our panelists continue to include some academics and, and, um, and central bankers, but also um, economists from the business world and members of the business community. And the overarching goal of today's session is to connect the technical research and the analysis, uh, the more academic analysis on inflation to the day-to-day -day concerns and observations of the business community and the general public. Uh, we've all, we felt um, here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland that it's important to broaden our conversations. It's important to go beyond the academic research and to broaden the conversation because then that provides more meaningful, uh, meaningful input. And in terms of inflation, what we hope to do is that by broadening our conversation, including the business community, that we will learn um, about what role inflation plays uh, in Main Street America and also the, the role that Main Street America plays in inflation. And so we have some outstanding presenters here today. Uh, there are several members uh, of our board of directors or past members of our board here today, but two of our board members are going to be um, panelists. Chuck Brown chairs the, um, our bank's uh, Cincinnati office and branch board there, and Don Hickton is chair of our Pittsburgh board. And they're going to be taking part in a panel uh, this morning, just before lunch, called The Voice of Business. And so we're very pleased that they are here to, to help us um, talk about some of these important issues. So I want to thank all of you for being here today, and thank you for making this a very constructive con uh, conference. Your insight has been very much valued and appreciated, and I hope you enjoy today's program. Now, I'm going to be back one more time at this podium, um, and that's at lunch to introduce our luncheon speaker, the next president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. So until then, uh, let's get started with this morning's session, and I'm going to turn it over to Ed Nozel. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so I have the honor of doing some of the logistical tasks this morning. Um, so a few announcements. So first off, 
for people who are not familiar, so the restrooms, most importantly, are through the doors to the right, through the double doors, and on the right-hand side, just in the hall out there. Um, second, uh, we are live streaming today's conference. Uh, so the access code is on the back of your program, in case you're interested in that. Um, we do have some social media tweeting and blogging of the conference. Uh, the tweet seats, not to be confused with the cheap seats, are right up there. Um, there's a sign with the tweet seats. Uh, if you would like to be a part of the social media conversation, uh, the Twitter hashtag is also on the back of your program. And we do have a monitor up front, right over here, um, if you would like to view some of the conversations. Now, in terms of getting things started here, so we have a 9 o'clock start time for session 5, so we have a couple of minutes just to relax, but just a few instructions beforehand. Um, so first off, we are going to have a timekeeper right here in front. Um, in terms of the flow of the sessions, uh, so each presenter will give some opening remarks, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And importantly, because we are live streaming, it's important to try and talk into a microphone, and if you're asking a question, please wait for a microphone to come to you so that we can capture what you're saying very well. Uh, so we have a few minutes just to relax, and at 9 o'clock sharp, we will get started with our first panel. Thank you.
Thank you, Paula. That's a Pavlovian bell. It always works. It's wonderful. Um, just a couple more logistics then before we start up. Um, so first off, there's a taxi sign-up that's on the back table if you need to catch a cab to the airport later on today. Uh, there is a Wi-Fi that's available in here. Um, it's called Omelette, I believe. And the password and login info are on, in your conference folders. Um, so again, my name's Ed Notek. I'm one of the organizers and hosts of this conference. And they couldn't put organizer on my tag, so I just have host on here. Um, but if you have questions, please, I'd be happy to address them or comments after the, uh, the conference. And most importantly, welcome. It's great to have everybody here today. So I'm going to introduce session five, continuing from where we ended off yesterday. Um, the fifth session today is measuring inflation accurately and effectively. And we have a great panel lined up for you. Uh, moderating our panel will be Mark Bills from the University of Rochester. So Mark is the Hazel Fife Professor of Economics at the University of Rochester, and he's a research associate of the NBER. Uh, Mark is an expert on wage setting and price setting and their implications for business cycles. And we are delighted to have him, and he'll introduce our speakers, and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Ed. Uh, the, the first speaker is Erica Groshen, who's the commissioner at the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Take it away, Erica. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. So it's a joy to be back in Cleveland. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I was actually here for seven years, from 86 to 93 in the research department. So it's really, um, being here reminds me of about seven happy years. And it's wonderful to see all my former colleagues here and to catch up with them. I'm going to congratulate President Pinalto on her second to last day of presidency and really all of her achievements um, during that time and recognize incoming President Loretta Mester um, on her selection. Now, I, uh, I want to thank Mark and Ed and Todd for inviting me to be here today. Um, I think that this idea of inflation central is a really great one, and we at the BLS, who are charged with measuring prices in the economy, look forward to being partners with them in this uh, important endeavor. Uh, and, and that's why uh, the biggest contingent here outside of the Cleveland Fed are the folks from the BLS. And so you want to stand up for just a second so people here see who you are. If you guys have questions. They represent the people who are actually putting those numbers together for you and doing some of the most path-breaking research on measures of inflation so that we keep improving our me measures all the time. Uh, so this important, obviously this imp event is really important to us because we're charged and we take very seriously our mission to produce, um, to produce measures that are accurate, objective, relevant, timely, and accessible. And if you put those together, they spell aorta. Our job is to be pushing, pumping, the needed data into the economic minds, the people who need to make decisions out there, the families, the businesses, the policy makers need this objective information, this good information on which to base their decisions. And in order to do that in this dynamic and really complex economy, we have to have open lines of communication with our data users, the people here in the Federal Reserve, the Cleveland Fed, but also the business leaders who use our information all the time and the families who use it to make their decisions. So conferences like this are an opportunity to keep you informed about what we're up to and make sure that we hear what you're seeing and the experiences that you're having. So let me go ahead. Let's see. This way? That way. Yes. So, Today we're really going to talk about the consumer price index. The idea behind this, what's happening to the average price level, is kind of simple, but the execution is not. And there are all of these different issues here, from the goals to the scope, uh, all the way down to the publication, 
that are actually fairly complex. And I'm going to try to run through them in 12 minutes, because that's all I have. <laughs> so what's our goal? In words, we're seeking to measure the change in the cost of living by measuring prices paid by consumers in urban areas of the US for a market basket of goods and services. And every, line, every word that I have underlined there excludes some things and includes other things. We're not talking about the prices paid by businesses. We're not, so we're not talking about machine tools here. And we're not talking about any business discounts. These are prices paid by consumers. We're only focusing on urban areas. And we're talking about a market basket purchased by the average consumer, not every single possible kind of consumer. And these are purchased for consumption, not investment, for example. All right. So when we think about this, this price measurement dates back to the 19th century. The BLS was created to measure prices when we had a period of very serious industrial unrest. And the policymakers realized that if at least there was trustworthy information about what was really happening to the price level, they could help quell some of this unrest. Since then, the measures that the BLS have created, particularly the Consumer Price Index, is, has been used for monetary policy, union contracts, social security payments, and a whole range of other things. Really important to the fabric, to the decision making in our society today. And these measures have really major personal business policy ramifications, really important ones. And that's why it's very important that these measures be credible, be produced by a nonpartisan agency that people can trust. And that's transparent so that everybody understands exactly what's in it. So let's start. Scope, geography. We collect data in 87 areas across the country. All these red and yellow and uh, blue areas, we're out there collecting. And they, these, uh, these represent the urban population of the US. And 89% of the US population lives within one of these areas. We combine those areas into 38 units that we report price changes for. When we report the price changes, we're talking about the price changes for a market basket. And that's the, a set of goods, goods and services that represent the sum total of everything that consumers buy. Right? But the market basket is for the average consumer. Right? And, it's, and our market basket, when we talk about it, we're thinking of a set of weights representing the share of spending by consumers on each one of these goods. And these weights are then used to, are combined with the prices that we collect to come out with a final number for what's have to happen to the cost of living. It gives us an average price change. And why do we have to do this averaging of the price changes? Because we're talking about a market economy. Relative prices are changing all the time. They have to change in order to direct resources into, in the most efficient way, to the most important places. Um, you know to uh, affect the shocks in the economy. So prices don't move in lockstep in our economy. And we have to measure everything to get a sense of what's happening to them on average. And the weights from the market basket are what allow us to average them. The source of the market basket is a survey that we do called the Consumer Expenditure Survey. This is actually two surveys. We have quarterly interviews with a sample to talk about the major purchases that they make. And for us, another sample, we have consumer diaries of everything they buy over a two-week period. We use all of that information to put together our market basket. We update this market basket every two years. Right now, we're using a market basket that's based on expenditures in 2011 and 2012. Our market basket you should think of is a list of weights for 211 item categories. Wait, okay. Uh, let's see what I do. Yep, yeah, okay. So the 211 categories are combined into eight big groups. Sometimes people just think of three food, energy, and what others called core. How do we collect the price data? Well, first of all, we have to figure out where. 
we're going to collect the prices from. So we have another survey called the Telephone Point of Purchase Survey, the TPOPs. In each of 87 areas, we do a survey to find out where people buy things. And we use that to select outlets to, uh, to price, to where we collect prices. And how do we collect prices? We've got field representatives visiting those outlets in person using computer-assisted data collection. We select, they select, and they price items on a probabilistic way, and they collect all of the characteristics of the items, because if they come back and that item isn't available anymore, they need to know exactly how the item that is available compares to the one that they priced last month. We rotate items in and out. Sample rotation means that we keep up to date with people, what people are actually buying, the, the models of cell phones or cars or foods that they're buying. And no matter what, every item is replaced every four years. So our CPI staff are looking for the retail transaction price that's actually paid by consumer, including any kind of taxes on it and any kind of discounts that are available on the day that they price it. We're talking about 400 part-time collectors, 100 full-time collectors. They visit 23,000 outlets in 87 cities, 83,000 individual items per month, and that's about a million prices per year. How do we estimate? We've got two stages in the estimation. We construct basic indexes, the 211 item categories by the 38 geographic units give us over 8,000 basic indexes. And then from there, we weight them by the market basket weights to come up with the aggregate indexes. And of course, the, top, the highest level is the overall price index that we're talking about, the headline index, the all items US city average. But we have many sub-indexes by area, by item category, so that you can understand how these different components enter into it. So I've been talking about averages. When you're talking about average, you're not matching e every person's individual experience, right? Every household, every person has their, has their own change in the cost of living. But we need, for these purposes, to find out what's happening on average. So the subgroups may have a different change in the cost of living than, uh, than the average as a whole. For instance, the elderly. We actually have, um, and we have a, uh, an estimate for them. So take a look at this. So we start off, the basic headline number is the CPIU. This is for all urban consumers. It's the broadest one. It's the headline numbers most people see. CPIW is restricted to wage earners and clerical workers. So the unemployed and the self-employed are not in here. That market basket is, um, is a little bit different. We also have what we call the CPIE. This is an experimental index that's based on the spending patterns of just the elderly, so that you can look at that one. And finally, we have something called the chained CPI. Now, this is the same population as the CPIU, the same urban consumers, but we do something a little bit different with the weights and the formula. And the reason we do it is because of concerns about substitution bias. Substitution bias arises because if you have the same market basket over time, but relative prices are changing and people are moving from the more expensive things to the less expensive things, you can be overestimating the importance of items that people have stopped buying quite as much of. Right. So when, they, when consumers change their spending behavior to reflect price increases, this can cause substitution bias. We already control for substitution bias within these narrow item categories, but sometimes you get it between item categories, such as airfare for gasoline. Gasoline prices go up, people start flying more often, or vice versa. Right? So uh, the change CPIU was created in 2002. 
It uses updated spending patterns and a special formula that takes advantage of monthly updated spending patterns. It's initially issued as an estimate. We revise it twice as the consumer expenditure survey information is updated. And in the end, we have a measure that's nearly free of substitution bias and reflects very current information on consumer spending. Then we publish it every month, and this is a picture of the top half of the uh, Consumer Price Index um, uh, uh, release form. Every month this comes out, there's a bunch of text talking about what's going on. There are some charts showing you the monthly increases and the 12 month moving averages of increases in prices. There are 30 pages of detailed numbers. And of course there's a link to the website that has the entire history of the CPI on it as well. There are regional CPI news releases for each of our areas, too. And if you want to know about what's been the uh, pattern of inflation over the last 100 years, because we now, the CPI, this is the CPI's 100th year, we have a, um, a recent paper on, uh, that, that looks at the entire inflation experience as seen through the lens of the CPI. And there's a companion piece now, this is in the Monthly Labor Review. It's a, it's a BLS publication. There's a companion piece that talks about how the methodology has changed over those 100 years. The way, what we're doing never stays the same. We're always trying to improve it. We have a new estimation system coming in very shortly, which will improve our flexibility, allow more research, and allow us to innovate more quickly. We're redesigning our consumer expenditure survey to take into account lots of new ways to collect information that will reduce burden and improve quality. And we're looking very hard at all the different ways that the growth of big data can help to expand uh, what we're able to do. Uh, allow us to collect quality. We already do web scraping for quality adjustments, but how can we do more? Price collection. Um, and redesigning our spending and our outlet surveys. So my final thoughts are uh, measuring inflation is really complicated. I hope I've convinced you it's complicated, although you can understand it. It just takes a little time. Right? Um, and trust is really key when we're doing this, that in order, if people are going to use this, they have to trust us that we're doing it right, that we're using the right skills, and that we are fully transparent about what it is we're up to. And so is accessibility. This information has to be widely shared so that everybody understands what's going on. And we need to give it equal access to everybody from all walks of society to this information. If you want to follow this even more closely, come to our website. It's all up there and even more. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter and get the most recent information as it is released. And we now have uh, 25, almost 25,000 Twitter followers, and it's growing rapidly, so you can join us on that. So I want to say thank you to the businesses and the households who participate in BLS surveys. Almost all of our surveys are voluntary, and yet we get the highest response rates that uh, uh, that are achievable, we get them in, uh, most of them over 80, over some many over 90 percent, and that's because people understand that they're performing a civic duty when they give us this information. And they want their experiences to be recorded and part of the national statistics. But it, uh, it, it's not without some cost to them, so I re we really appreciate the civic duty performed by everybody who participates in our surveys. And of course, I want to thank the conference organizers because they're providing a forum for the kind of vital informed discourse about the statistical system and what it means that's so important for making our country work well. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Erica. Our next speaker is. Our next speaker is Michael Bryant, who's a, a, a vice president and, and a senior economist at the research department of the Atlanta Fed. All right, good. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me here, uh, Todd and Mark. Uh, it's nice to be home, um, and it's so nice to be here um, so that I too can um, celebrate uh, Sandy Pianolto's tenure as president. We worked together for many, many years. 
uh, and I'm very grateful for the experience and welcome to Cleveland, Loretta. Um, as do all officials of the Federal Reserve, uh, let me say that uh, the views you're about to hear are not necessarily um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Federal Reserve Board, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Um, but let me also say I think they ought to be. <laughs> um, so with the time afforded me this morning, uh, and it isn't as nearly as much as I'd like. I'd like to describe some of the ways that um, uh, I torture uh, Commissioner Groshen's uh, data uh, for alternative <laughs> perspectives on the inflationary experience. Uh, I want to be clear here. I'm not trying to say that the BLS has somehow got it wrong. Um, I don't believe that. Uh, in fact, I think the CPI is an exceptionally well-designed statistic for its intended purpose. It's just that I don't believe its intended purpose was necessarily the measurement of inflation that a central bank uh, hopes to control. Um, and so let me talk about some of the things that, that we do to our data um, uh, to, to provide deeper, a different insight uh, into uh, what I think it is the Federal Reserve and its price stability mandate is all about. Uh, the Economist magazine tells a, a story of a conversation with Steve Roach who in the 1970s uh, worked for um, uh, then chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Arthur Burns. And Roach, Roach remembers that when oil prices surged in 1973, uh, Burns asked the staff economists at the board to strip them out of the CPI to get a less distorted measure. And when food prices then rose sharply, they stripped that out of the CPI too, followed by used cars, children's toys, jewelry, housing, and so on until at least half of the CPI was excluded because it was distorted by some outside force that was outside the uh, uh, control of the central bank. And the story goes on to say that because of all these exclusionary techniques, at least the Fed failed to uh, spot the breadth of the inflationary threat that was occurring in the 1970s. I have a very similar story to tell. Um, it was a morning back in, uh, in this bank in 1991 uh, where I was addressing our, our board of directors and uh, Director Labe Jackson welcomed me to the lectern with, now it's time to see what Mike is going to throw out of the CPI this month. <laughs> it, it was an embarrassing moment for me, uh, not my worst, not my last, uh, but it had an influence on me that was lasting because it was after that meeting uh, that the uh, Cleveland's median CPI was, was conceived. Um, here, here's the underlying problem. Oops, see, let me just press that. Um, what you're looking at here uh, is the CPI. A actually, the CPI is the dotted uh, black line. That's the non-seasonally adjusted uh, all-item CPI. I want to show the non-seasonally adjusted because, after all, who buys seasonally adjusted things, right? I mean, that's what people experience. Uh, but most economists encourage the BLS uh, to uh, um, uh, filter out seasonal fluctuations in the prices to get to this artificial concept called the overall seasonally adjusted CPI. That's the red line. And you can see the uh, shaded uh, uh, dark area is uh, the Fed's uh, uh, target for inflation of 2% plus or minus 1%. Now, I know this C the, 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 the Federal Reserve targets the PCE uh, and not the CPI, but I think you got an idea of what, what the problem here is, so that as an economist, uh, when the CPI gets um, reported, I can expect a phone call from the boss that says uh, something like, um, well, uh, what happened to the CPI and what do you think of it? And I got to come up with an answer. Um, so, so, so let me tell you the way I, I used to do it. Oopsie. So, so here's the April CPI report. Um, so what you're looking at in the horizontal ox axis, uh, that's uh, uh, the annualized percent change of uh, individual prices inside the CPI, and the vertical axis, that's their weight, right? So uh, last month, uh, we were experiencing price increases anywhere from a positive, I think it was about 35%, to a negative uh, 60 70%, uh, I can't remember. Uh, the CPI average, uh, uh, seasonally adjusted, was 3.2%, which is way off the FOMC's objective. So what should the Federal Reserve do? Uh, is it time to start tightening monetary policy because you're considerably above um, uh, uh, your objective? Uh, well, what I used to do is I take a look at the CPI. Uh, why do I keep going in the wrong direction? And I uh, spend a little bit of time with it. And I would note, for example, last month gasoline prices were up 30 some percent. I can't remember exactly. But if you subtract gasoline prices out of the CPI, bingo, 2%. 
we're on target, uh, enough said. Um, see, I'm really good at reading the CPI report. <laughs> I go into every CPI report knowing exactly what the rate of inflation is, and the only trick is trying to figure out what I got to throw out of the CPI. <laughs> uh, to reveal truth. Uh, and so Labe Jackson, who was criticizing me, as he uh, did quite frequently, uh, he was right. Uh, uh, I was giving them what I thought the rate of inflation was because um, um, I was um, unintentionally biasing. Uh, what I uh, called a distorted price and what I didn't, uh, something that Arthur Burns perhaps uh, learned uh, very late in his career. Um, he, see, here's the thing. There's no such thing as a non-distorted price. I mean, all prices are moving uh, on the basis of, 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 of market conditions, and once they start moving, they affect all the other prices in the price index. Um, so what we decided to do was, uh, what I decided to do was take a more serious look at the underlying distribution. And, and here's what a normal, here's what the CPI looks like on average over the last 10 years. This is a, a, a monthly a price change. Uh, and what you can see is the April report isn't unusual in any sense. In fact, the CPI always has these really long tails. There's always stuff that's really extreme in its price movement. Uh, but also keep in mind this uh, very peaked uh, central part of the distribution. Uh, well, the way I like to think of it in the statistical sense is what's going on is that these uh, observations from the tail are wagging the CPI from month to month, but it's tethered to this interior center. Okay? We call uh, uh, this a highly uh, kurtotic or pla platicurtic uh, distribution. And one of the things that we know about platicurtic distributions is that when you sample from such a world, what you tend to do is get wide fluctuations around that central tendency. So what I would say is the CPI is a very noisy signal of what it is the central bank is, uh, is trying to control. I'm not trying to say that this is necessarily um, um, uh, uh, a poor reflection of the cost of living. I think the cost of living is by its nature a highly volatile thing. Uh, I just want to argue that, uh, uh, that it's not entirely clear to me uh, that um, uh, that, that, so that's something that the uh, central bank needs to uh, worry about on a monthly basis. Uh, later, Steve Cicchetti and I thought about a full range of uh, trim mean estimators, not just the median CPI, not just the thing in the middle, but to trim away uh, various tails of the distribution. We can trim away as many or as, or as little as you wish. We settled on the 16% trim mean. It had a low variance, and besides my uh, friend and colleague John Carlson loved the index, so we just decided to keep it. Um, uh, um, but I want to be very clear here. Uh, that what's going on with the median CPI or the trim mean estimators, I would not call core inflation. Uh, I have called core inflation. Uh, in fact, I wrote the first paper. I said it was core inflation. I don't believe that anymore. Uh, uh, and why don't I believe that? Well, I'm not entirely sure what the uh, definition of core inflation is, but um, uh, I, I think it's more akin uh, to seasonal adjustment. Okay, we are not altering the underlying weighting structure of the CPI. We're, we're calculating these trim means and we're calculating the median on the basis of the CPI weights. And every month those weights come back into play. Every other measure of core inflation that I can think of fundamentally alters the weights of the price index. You are no longer looking at the same object. And to say, so to say that you're um, somehow thinking about a cost of living concept, I think is no longer true when we're talking about core inflation. That is not to say that I'm a critic of core inflation. I love core inflation. Okay? I just think it's a much different thing uh, than the cost of living that Erica uh, is trying to, um, to measure. Let me... Um, uh, I got I got to close here, but let me let me make t a couple of statements uh, that I think are in individually uh, generally accepted by economists, but when we put them together, it creates something of a puzzle. Now, here are my two statements. Number one, inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Over time, the Federal Reserve determines what the rate of inflation is going to be. All right. Um, and uh, 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 my second uh, uh, statement is that uh, what the central bank, uh, excuse me, what the BLS wants to measure with the CPI is the cost of living. And the cost of living is a real concept. It exists in a world without money. 
Erica Groshen could measure the cost of living without appealing to dollars. The problem is that the, the way we measure value, the numeraire, money, makes inflation and the cost of living commingled. We can talk sensibly about the cost of living in New York and whether it's rising faster or slower than Cleveland. We can talk sensibly of whether the cost of living of the elderly is somehow different than the young, and on and on and on. I do not think we can talk sensibly about whether the rate of inflation is different in New York than in Cleveland because they use the same dollars. I do not believe we can talk sensibly about whether the rate of inflation is different for the old than it is for the poor. And when we start thinking about it that way, we start thinking about her market basket in a much different way. She is constrained to expenditure weights, and that is the right thing to do. Why? Because this is the thing that you care about when you measure the, the uh, rate of, of, of cost of living. Okay? These are important. I understand why medical care is important to you and why, therefore, it should have a larger weight in your market basket when she's trying to measure your cost of living. But does medical care have a stronger inflation signal than any other good in the price index? It's not at all clear to me that it does. And I think it's important for the central bank to appeal to many different incarnations of this data to triangulate in on the rate of inflation that they hope to uh, control. Uh, let me just finish with a couple of, 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 of examples. Um, by the way, nah, nah. there's a median CPI and the 16% uh, trim mean. And again, you can see how much easier it is to, to track whether or not the Federal Reserve is uh, living within its mandate. I have one minute. Oh, my goodness. Uh, OK, uh, let me uh, talk about the uh, two ways that you might think about uh, re reorganizing her data. One is work I've done with Brent Meyer, uh, uh, who I've uh, uh, coaxed to come uh, down to Atlanta Fed. My apologies, uh, Cleveland. Um, uh, and that's uh, the sticky price CPI. We were inspired by Mark Bills's work. I don't know if he wants to accept any kind of credit for this. Uh, but uh, look, uh, prices change in the CPI for many different reasons. Some of them change all the time. Some of them change all the time and make small changes, and some of them make big changes. Some of them don't change very often, and when they do, it tends to be a big change. What's going on here? Mark talks about certain sticky prices inside the CPI. We think that stickiness might be telling us something about the forward-looking nature of prices. So if you could take her data and separate it out into the sticky prices from the flexible prices, what would you find? What we found is that the flexible prices seem to be very responsive to the economy, but they don't have a very forward-looking component. The sticky price CPI, on the other hand, is that constellation inside the CPI that does seem to be very forward-looking. So if you're interested in inflation expectations, and I believe the central bank is, this might be one perspective on her data that you would find useful. And let me finish with one more thing. We've been experimenting for years with uh, signal extraction techniques. Let the data speak for itself. I don't know what the weight should be. Let's throw out the data and see if we can identify a common signal. Uh, Steve Cicchetti and I did a lot of work on dynamic factor indices. We didn't go very far with it. Uh, I'm not as good a statistician, but uh, 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 Reese and Watson have done a lot of work in the area uh, uh, later. But uh, let me just show you, if you a simple st statistical technique called the first principal component. And let's just see what a common signal coming out of all this data that Erica produces, what sort of uh, signal would that provide? It's that red line there. And it tends to be very, very stable, right? And I think this might be a good candidate. Uh, I would do it with dynamic factor indices and others, but a very good candidate for this underlying thing I would call movements in the numeraire that the central bank wants to control. And if you do it that way, how would you weight the price index? The answer, principal component weights and dynamic factor weights will bear this out. Rents are very important. I got to stop. So those people who say the CPI overweights housing in the price index, that might be true in a cost of living sense. I don't really think it is, but it could be. But as an inflation signal, maybe we ought to be spending, paying more attention to housing. The same would be true of uh, restaurant bills, motor vehicle repair. What doesn't get hardly any weight in uh, one of these signal extraction methods? Gasoline, medical care commodities, tobacco. These are the sorts of things that fluctuate and don't seem to have any persistence or have any usefulness to the central bank. So let me conclude by saying, uh, oh gosh, uh, well, uh, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post this on macro blog because uh, I, I simply don't have the time. 
and maybe we'll get to it in, in questions and answers. But uh, let me say, look, I think what Erica and uh, her colleagues do is uh, really first rate, uh, and I want to take that data and uh, cut it and slice it and dice it in so many different perspectives. Um, uh, you're free to use them or free to ignore them at will, uh, but I think the more perspectives we have on the measurement of inflation, the better we're going to be. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. And, and our last panelist is Joe Hubbard from the Cleveland Fed. He's Vice President and Economist. Thanks, Mark. Um, as you would expect, these are my views, not those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or the Federal Reserve System um, or Atlanta, et cetera. Um, I, I, I'm going to take a somewhat different uh, approach here, um, which is if you're going to look at inflation, you could look at the actual numbers, you could ask people, but there's another way, which is you can actually look at what's happening in the financial markets. Um, because there are a variety of financial instruments that are directly based on inflation, and there's a lot of interesting information in that. Now, there are a variety of good reasons for taking a financial markets approach. First of all, financial markets aggregate information. There are a lot of people involved with the financial market. They're buying and selling these various instruments. So you've got a lot of different people with different opinions and a lot of individual information that gets aggregated, aggregated up into the market price. So that's a good advantage. The second thing, these are financial instruments. It's not someone, you know, granted Commissioner Groshen tells you a lot of people, you know, have a lot of public feeling and they fill out their diaries and they ask the surveys and that's very good. In the financial markets, people really have their money where their mouth is. They're going to gain or lose at times a lot of money if they really get this question wrong when they're investing in inflation instruments. So they really have a strong motivation for thinking about this hard using whatever information that they really have. Um, and the third reason is, is that the data is very frequent. These instruments are often traded within the day, and so if you want to get an idea of what people are thinking about inflation, you don't necessarily have to wait for the monthly release of the CPI. It's something that you can look at the financial markets and go to your Bloomberg terminal. Now, given that, there's got to be a few cautions about this. First of all, most, almost all the instruments that are traded in the U.S. are on a particular type of the CPI. That's, diff that's important because it's been pointed out beforehand, the Fed's goal is phrased in terms of the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures. So you may not be getting a measure of exactly what it is that the Fed is trying to look at. Secondly, as Erica pointed out, there are different flavors of the CPI as well. What's used in the financial markets in Treasury inflation protected securities and inflation swaps is the CPIU. The CPIW is what Social Security uses to adjust its payments. So again, you may not get a measure of what you're most interested in if you're wondering what's going to happen to your COLA clause. Finally, these are people in the financial markets. It's a lot of people in Wall Street, LaSalle Street in Chicago. So it may not be directly comparable with what the man in the street actually is thinking about where he or she thinks inflation is going to be. So again, there are reasons why there's a lot of information, but it's not directly comparable. Now, probably uh, the most used and a very good way to look at what financial market expectations of inflation are is to look at what's known as the break-even rate from Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. So here, you look at the interest rate in a nominal Treasury bond, which isn't protected against inflation, with the interest rate from a Treasury Inflation Protected Security, which is protected against inflation. Look at the difference, and that should give you an expectation of inflation. And that's pretty good. There's you know, one problem I'd like to point out, if you look at this graph of what the expected inflation rate coming from the TIPS market is over the past almost a decade, you can see there was a huge drop at the end of 2008, the beginning of 2009. Now, if you look at that, maybe it was the case that people really thought we would have deflation prices going down for the next 10 years. 
Okay, I guess that's a possibility, but I would say maybe we were in the midst of a financial crisis and you had a huge flight to quality. And in fact, the flight to quality was so huge that people were making a distinction between nominal treasury bonds, which are the most liquid and most traded bonds in the financial market, with the inflation protected bonds, which aren't as liquid. And in fact, I've heard traders call TIP stands for totally illiquid pieces of something or another. <laughs> Usually it's okay, but in times of a big financial crisis, there can be a distortion. So another way is to look at what people are thinking and what they tell you, either a survey of professional forecasters, or there's something known as an inflation swap, which is an inflation derivative, which is really like it sounds. One side of the swap, I will pay you a fixed percentage for what I think inflation will be. You will pay me what inflation actually is over the next year or 10 years. So you don't have that liquidity problem. Again, you can see that's rolling around 2.5% or 25 to 3%. It doesn't have the liquidity problem. But again, like tips, there's an additional problem. As probably came abundantly clear from Mike Bryan's presentation, the level of inflation changes a lot. It's uncertain. The CPI varies quite a bit. And so along with these financial markets giving you a measure of expected inflation, there's an inflation risk premium as well. So you don't get a pure measure of what inflation expectation is. You get a combination of expected inflation plus a risk premium. So that's not the whole story. So what do we do in Cleveland? Um, I'm going to like say we have a black box. It's a model where you have to make a lot of assumptions, but as inputs we take inflation swaps, we take survey measures of inflation from the survey of professional forecasters, um, from the blue chip economic forecasters, inflation swaps, and nominal treasury securities, put them into a big complicated computer model, and that enables us to extract what the inflation risk premium is and get a pure measure of inflation. So this is um, the output of what we get if you run the model back to 1982. The inflation risk premium turns out to be roughly half a percent. You look at this picture from 82 and you say inflation expectations have come down since the early 80s. Maybe there's not a lot of news in that. So let's focus a little bit more closely on what's been happening over the past few years. And here you can see again the inflation risk premium somewhere around half a percent. Varies a bit, but not a huge amount. And you can see that during 2012 and 13, inflation expectations were somewhat lower, definitely around a percent and a half. Since then, they've been moving a bit back more towards the Fed's target of 2%. So that's one way of looking at the perspective. But you can actually, because you've got inflation swaps at a lot of different maturities, you can actually look at expected inflation at a whole lot of different tenors. So this is something we call the expected inflation yield curve. Um, and it varies over time. You can again see that in May 2013, on average, people expected inflation to be about a percent lower than it is now. On the other, maybe that's half a percent. On the other hand, you can see that things have moved up, and you can see that while in the short term, inflation expectations are relatively low, somewhere around a percent and a half. Over the longer haul, people actually think that inflation might be moving back up to that 2% level. But again, that's over the longer haul, over 20 years. And, and again, if you're going to get at the question that was talked a lot about yesterday, is inflation anchored? Are we worried about where people think inflation's going to go? Having this long perspective is something that can be very useful. Now, when you've got a lot of years, one of the things that I like to say is you can actually look at, well, where is inflation going to be in the future? Um, we like to call this, you know, um, maybe believing our own press releases, we call this the policy relevant forward rate. But this is saying, where is inflation going to be between two years and three years between two years and five years. So it's a three-year, two-year forward rate. The idea being, let's get out of the problems that we have right now where there's a potentially uncertain, and let's look at what some of the longer expectations of inflation are. Again, you can see a similar pattern that we've seen in some of the other data. 
that it was low for a while, it's actually moving back up towards 2%. So I think this is potentially, you know, something that's very useful. If you don't like the three-year, two-year, um, we've got a lot of different years that in some sense you can go to our website, mix and match what you actually want for what you think the most policy relevant forward rate is going to be. So I think looking at the financial markets is an important way to look at things. You can find this data on our website, and it's not unique to us. Like Mike Bryan said, you want to look at these um, numbers from a lot of different perspectives. Um, the New York Fed puts out a similar number, as does the San Francisco Fed. Um, the Atlanta Fed has a deflation probability that they take from the financial markets. So again, it's a way to triangulate and get a view of what inflation expectations are. But as I said, when you think about people have money where their mouth is and you aggregate a lot of information, I think the financial markets are certainly an important part of any notion of figuring out where inflation expectations are. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm going to turn it open. I had one comment, though. I want to comment on this uh, issue of the goals of the BLS that Erica talked about versus the you know, instruments for the public and the Fed that, that Joe and Mike talked about. So uh, just as a definitional thing, you know, inflation, cost of living inflation comes from the expenditure function. So it's the, it's the extra spending you'd need to reach a certain utility level or, you know, well, well-being is given how the world changes over time, particularly prices, prices that go from up, down, from infinity to, to finite. And so um, that's not what the public typically labels inflation for good reason. That's not, I don't think, what the Fed labels inflation for good reasons. But I want to just point out why I think it's very important that somebody keeps that as their goal. And, and that would, I guess, be the, the BLS, which uh, the BLS numbers are you know, key to going into national income accounts. The only way we measure real growth in the economy is based on measuring the cost of living increase. We don't measure the count, the number of cars that go off the assembly line or the, you know, the ingots of this or that or the, or the successful surgeries or not. It's all based on measuring nominal expenditures and then deflating by prices. So I really feel like that, that is a, a very important goal of price measurement. I just want to uh, loop back to that, but the, um, I mean, if you look at it from the public's perspective, uh, perspective, over the last 20 years, the price of durable consumer goods has fallen by a third, more than a third, so almost minus 2% inflation, and that's partly because the BLS has rightly, I think, brought in a lot of uh, new measurements. Computers are a lot of that. Computers have like 20% deflation per year, but overall durables are like minus 2%. Now, if you ask somebody on the street, is that, uh, you know, what, what's happened to inflation, should they take that into account? You know, I, I don't know. In uh, December 19, I looked this up, December 1976, the official inflation rate was like 6% annualized. I turned 18 that month, I could go into bars. So a price which was arguably infinite became finite. <laughs> so, you know, what happened to my cost of living? It was a huge deflation that month, right? <laughs> but should the public give uh, the way they think of inflation all that credit for, should it go to Apple or should they think about, you know, the, the Fed has secured our, our inflation rate because we have all this technological innovation. And relatedly, I don't think the Fed should, should target the cost of living number. They should target whatever is the right thing to target. Maybe they should target the cost of a cup of coffee and a newspaper. If that's what you, you know, you get change off your dresser in the morning, you want to know how much change to take, maybe that's a better index than, 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 than some cost of living index. If we get some huge technological innovation and half the, the goods started to, to improve in quality at 20% per year like computers, and that was a source of 10% deflation, should they let all the other prices in the economy go up 10% per year? That would seem nuts to me. So I would say a natural index to produce for the BLS would be a static inflation rate, which just takes a set of goods which have sort of a static product space, you know, like milk and et cetera, uh, cigarettes, you know, things where the, the, the product space is pretty static. And, and, and that would be a natural thing, I think, for the Fed to stabilize. And, and again, I think, you know, the BLS has done a lot to bring in more quality improvement. 
I still think it's, you know, dramatically uh, wrong because it's just, you know, virtually an impossible thing to measure. So if you look at medical care, if you look at the medical CPI has gone up by a factor of four over the last 30 years. Now, if you think of yourself, you have some serious medical problem, which is when the cost of the, the goods are most relevant, and you're going to be dropped into the world now with a certain amount of nominal income, or 30 years ago with the same nominal income, which world would you rather be dropped into? I, I don't think it's at all clear. I think I might prefer to be dropped today. I think I certainly would, frankly, which means there's been deflation for over the last 30 years for, for medical care. I'm not convinced there's been positive inflation on, overall for the last 30 years. I think I'd rather have all the goods we can consume today than 30 years ago. Certainly, I would rather have today's income with today's prices than in 1800s where you could buy saddle and soap and candles and a few things. So. Well, I, so I think it's important that somebody gets at this sort of true measure, difficult as it is, to figure out what's the consumer surplus from these goods. Because it's the only way to get a real measures of growth in the economy, which I think is important to judge, you know, how does the economy do now vis-a-vis -vis the same economy when they had a very different strategies and policies versus other economies that take different approaches. So I think it is really crucial, but I don't, don't you know, the measurement problems are huge, and I think it's really I'm a little scared by Erica's slide where she talks about the goals, and I really feel these goals are really at odds. You, you wouldn't want to find out, yeah, we're going to switch to having zero inflation and have all these tips markets and others that are you know, contractually related to what was measured. I, I think it's you know, most important to get somebody gets a real measure of growth in the economy and let the Fed and all these other contracts figure out what they should contract on. And, uh, or, or focus on, but that would be my one comment, uh, long comment, but one comment. <laughs> so uh, we'll open it up. Yeah. Dr. Groshen, yes. I'd like to uh, suggest the possibility of renaming your CPIE. Uh, I don't know if I like to be known as an elderly consumer. <laughs> I prefer experienced consumer. <laughs> and, I <Me> don't, too. <laughs> and I don't know if I fit your profile of the uh, average experienced consumer, but I, I take away from your presentation that your prices are collected from brick and mortar sites. To what extent do you collect prices for on internet sold goods and services? Because I'm finding my, I'm purchasing more and more products online. So we do collect prices on, on the internet. For instance, I mean, there's some goods that are mostly sold that way. For instance, um, uh, uh, cell phone services, mostly priced on the internet, and we get that information largely off the internet the same way with uh, uh, some utility prices and things like that. So uh, I couldn't go through all the different ways that we collect prices um, in my 10 minutes, and I even sh overshot my 10 minutes anyway, but you're absolutely right that, uh, that we need to consider all outlets, and those are, in the, um, uh, th those are within the scope that we look at. Uh, and in terms of uh, experienced versus uh, elderly, the, uh, what defines it in our CPIE is people who are age 62 plus, and as someone who's getting very close to that, you're right, I think we have to have another term. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I just had a quick question for Erica about Quality. You only touched briefly on quality for using the big data. So I was wondering what other attempts you make to control for quality improvements. We take uh, different approaches. Uh, the one, um, the main thing is, you know, when we're pricing something already, and then that uh, the model number changes on it, or we get some some other good that we are going to slot into where we have. Um, uh, to kind of substitute for what the price of the thing we were measuring before. One of the things we do uh, is we have a hedonic measures. Uh, we have a, a program that, that um, 
that uh, assigns a certain value to the various characteristics, and then we adjust it using that hedonic measurement. So I think that that's one of the main ways. Uh, my colleagues, uh, are there any other uh, uh, quality measurements that we should talk about? Yes. We also, we, we also make adjustments for what we call new and disappearing goods. New and disappearing goods. So, for example, when cell, for, cell phones first came in, they were a new good. They didn't replace, you know, the one on the, the wall or whatever. Um, so it's a new good. And then there's some like, um, well, we still price candles. But, I mean, it's not the main source of electricity anymore. It's not under electricity. It's probably under household goods now. So, you know, we do account for new and disappearing goods as well. Getting to Mark's question about... Um, about uh, new goods or, or uh, different kinds of goods that, that serve the same purpose. So a lot of what Mark was talking about was, gee, uh, uh, you, may, you may have some, um, some illness that used to be treated by surgery, and now we can treat it with, uh, with medication. And that's one of the, that, that sort of thing is one of the biggest challenges for us in the CPI, because it's easy to compare the price of this pill to that pill. But when people start switching from surgery to pills, then that's a harder thing to include in the CPI. So particularly in the, in the medical area, we're doing a lot of research uh, about trying to switch the pricing to a more, something closer to the way DRGs work to say, well, if, uh, if, if, uh, how do we price treatment for a condition, right? And so that's a challenge, but that's a direction that we know we have to go in. I am an economist who has taught economics for over 30 years and in two continents. And uh, I've observed uh, various uh, economic concepts for quite a while. And uh, my concern this morning pertaining to your presentation is the point you made that your consumer expenditure surveys are based on a two weeks spending period. How critical is your particular two weeks spending period? In other words, how representative are those two weeks in a whole year's spending period for your typical urban family that is represented in your consumer uh, spending basket. In other words, how efficiently uh, chosen your particular spending basket is in terms of the period of compilation of data and in terms of the representative commodities. And the other question I have is um, you also uh, just a minute, I think I've forgotten my second point. Let me just think about it. <laughs> All right. Well, in any case, when I think about it, I will raise my hand again. Thanks. Okay. So um, uh, each participant actually ends up reporting for four weeks, two separate two-week periods. Right. Uh, and we, the reason that it takes a long time to, to get uh, a year's worth of data is that we distribute it over the year so that it will be representative. So while we don't want to burden any particular consumer with reporting their daily expenditures for an entire year, we do it by, um, by sampling different weeks of the year uh, across different people. Right. I, I got that right, Cece, right? <laughs> yeah, actually, I should say there, there are two surveys. That's right. There are two different samples and two different surveys. One is an interview where a consumer unit or a household is, enters the sample and can be up into the sample for data collection up to four quarters. That covers 12 months, right? Then there's a separate survey where it's two, it's, it's two consecutive one-week periods. And we use, and again, as Erica was saying, that's collected over the full year. And these are samples based on population distributions across the United States. So it, it does account for all different uh, ge geographic as well as demographic variables. But it, uh, we do have data being collected throughout the whole year. And for periods like right before a big holiday like 
Christmas, for example, we oversample because a lot of people are, are decide that they can't participate at that time. When we say that there's 12 months for the interview, uh, we're using the data for each quarter independently because there's not a requirement that people stay in the survey for those 12 months. We use each quarter in the calculation of the price index. So your concerns are very real, and uh, that's part of the work of our mathematical statisticians and our economists to try and deal exactly with your concerns. Jack? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead in the back first. We'll get your microphone. I'm wondering to any of the panelists if there is research that has determined that um, the urban measurement is statistically valid for rural areas, if there are any periods of time that there could be anomalies that it would not be statistically valid, or if simply the purpose of the urban measurement uh, and the reason that the Fed or other central banks would be using an urban measurement um, does not require a measurement of rural areas. Some of it is about being cost effective. It's actually very difficult to collect some of that information in the rural areas just to get people out there to do it. All right. um, another element in it is that uh, certainly traditionally many um, in the rural areas, there was a, a lot of, um, uh, it's a, it was less cash-based society. There was much more trading and use of, uh, of goods that people grew for themselves, and so they were less sensitive to, to prices at the time. So I think uh, those are probably the main uh, reasons, and there's probably more variation in these very small markets, so you'd get a lot of noise if you included them. Can I make it? Sure. I mean, over a window of time, like, I mean, if you care about inflation over a couple of years, you know, a lot of goods that are traded, the relative prices are going to, you know, if I look at a decade's inflation, the rural areas for cars versus in the cities or more rural, they're going to have to kind of move together because there's arbitrage stuff. The stuff where you'd be most worried, I think, would be on the, on the housing. And in the housing, you could probably do cost effective on rents in more rural areas, because that's a whole different sort of nature anyway. So I mean, if you were going to augment it for the more rural, the first step would be to just augment, maybe they do it already on the rents, but you could just augment just the, the housing costs in the rural areas, because that's the easiest to get, and it's where the, it's very important, and it's where the biggest discrepancy is. It's just harder to arbitrage you know, housing in a rural area, in a city area. Yeah, Tish. Even in our urban areas, we have something called a, um, uh, a size D uh, area, which means it's, it's, it's a small city. For example, I don't know if you're familiar with North Carolina, but like Rocky Mount, it's, a, it's not a big city. It's not a capital city. It's a small, it's actually a big town. And that would be in our price index. So when we think of urban, it's not urban like, Washington, D.C., or Cleveland, or Chicago, we actually do have smaller areas, but we don't produce a price index for that smaller area. We do have what are called self-representing cities, but these smaller areas are definitely in our index, just not farms that are far out, for example. Yeah, go ahead. So we've learned that there's a, it's a complicated issue, isn't it? And, um, but think of it from a business standpoint, and they have to make decisions going forward in time. So we've had three or four views here on how to measure it and what's good, what's the bad and the ugly. What would you tell a business person in terms of, of trying to uh, make a uh, forecast or a plan for the future understanding where prices might be. I mean, we have various ways, the financial markets, we have the, the, the Brian approach, uh, Mark, your approach, and certainly Eric. I think anybody uh, would like to figure out what might be a simple way, but it's complicated. Uh, so what would you advise a business person as they're trying to think about three, four years, as they're uh, making investments or considering investments? How do you factor in uh, this inflation or potential for inflation into their decision process? 
to give the others a chance to think. I would say use all of the data that the BLS has. <laughs> um, talk to our people to make sure you understand exactly what it means and then talk to experts like this because we don't forecast inflation. They do. <laughs> Maybe well, do some hedging. <laughs> <laughs> well, we forecast inflation at the Atlanta Fed um, and we're not very good at it. Um, um, and I don't think that's a, necessarily a problem at the Atlanta Fed, uh, other than the Cleveland Fed, of course, which has gotten it right. I think the forecast <laughs> of inflation is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, you know, what, what sort of information do businesses need? I mean, we spent a lot of time, I, I touched on this yesterday, talking to businesses about the inflationary experience. You know, what do they got to care about? They got to care about the market for their particular good. They got to care about the costs of their uh, production, uh, commodity prices, wages. Um, it's not at all clear to me that a single measure like the CBI is going to be that crucial. It's going to be important to them. They're going to think about that, and they're going to think about that when they think about interest rates and when's the right time to do um, certain investments. But that's going to be swamped by the micro considerations. Well, how strong is the market for my for my good? And we we talk to firms and we ask them, you know what? Um, uh, what do you think is going to happen to the price of your product over the next 12 months? Now give me a good, uh, an idea of what a good year would be in your prices. Now give me a, an idea of what a bad year would be on your prices. Now tell me what probabilities you would assign to these various outcomes as part of your business plan. And these range of possibilities are huge and they're incredibly, um, um, uh, they're, they vary a great deal by the nature of the business, the size of the business, not so much by the geography, uh, but the depth of the market that they're in, whether it's international or not, these are the big issues. Um, and, 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 and so we spent a lot of time getting that from the decision makers themselves. Um, but if they want to use our data, if they would find that useful, um, it's certainly available on our websites. So I think there are a variety of tools that people have touched on. I mentioned the financial markets. There are various surveys. Um, there's Blue Chip, Survey of Professional Forecasters. There's the Michigan Survey. Um, to, I think, reiterate what Mike Bryan said, a lot of it really will depend on what the business needs. For some, you know, in a consumer-based industry, probably having a decent guess of where inflation's going is probably pretty important. Um, if you're a steel producer, the, you know, the price of iron ore, and that's going to be really important, and that's, you know, not necessarily really closely tied over the next year to what the CPI is going to do. I think Simpson Bowles said that chain CPI is a, is a better measure. I mean, do, do you think that was substantive, or do you think that's political? We think that the change CPI uh, doesn't suffer from the substitution bias that the normal CPI does. Now, whether people want to, uh, the decision of what to peg what set of benefits to is a political decision and not one that, that we engage in. We simply produce the measures that, um, uh, that, that we think are the best ones to answer people's questions. So uh, it, it's up to the policymakers to decide which of, the, uh, which of the measures that we produce are the right ones for the purposes they need. Okay. I apologize if we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we have run over a couple minutes, so I just want to thank our panelists again. Just give us a minute while we swap out the pen.